All right, so in our third and final installment of Dissecting the Bike Industry, where we share whether or not you all think these technologies and standards that have recently been introduced in the bike world are worthy innovations or just marketing hype. In this particular video, we chat about in-between bikes, brakes, drivetrains, and much more. And if you missed our first two videos, make sure to find the links in the description below to watch those. Let's do it. All right, so we have Shimano to thank for this little thing right here, the flat mount brake caliper, which was officially launched in 2015. Shimano and a variety of road bike brands thought it would be a good idea to make a different standard for road slash gravel bikes versus mountain bikes. But let's not forget that Hayes basically came up with the flat mount 22 millimeter caliper. Anyways, we're here talking about it today because the flat mount brake caliper replaced the post mount on many drop bar bikes on the market, if not all of them now. I'm not gonna lie, I'm pretty surprised by these results. Most people, 36.5% had no opinion or were unsure with flat mount brakes. 33.6% thought it was marketing hype and 29.9% thought it was a worthy innovation. So when I thought of dissecting the bike industry topic, flat mount brakes was the first thing that came to mind. But perhaps my hatred towards this standard is not as widespread according to the results. Flat mount calipers do have two things going for them. A slightly more sleek look than the post mount, especially on say rigid forks, and no need to place aluminum threads inside carbon rear triangles, as the new flat mount standard basically now come with holes through the frame, uh, even some through the fork. But that's kind of where the downturn starts. Aside from some forks that do have aluminum threads installed, many forks have bolt heads mounted through the other side of the fork, which kind of takes away that sleek aesthetic. This also aids in the frustration to center the rotor in the calipers. Generally speaking here, the adjustability is much more challenging than a post mount brake caliper. And while it might be the caliper itself and the alignment, a lot of times it's actually the inconsistency in the frame as a flat mount caliper actually requires a flat mounting surface. And the fact that post mount was able to kind of hide those inconsistencies was actually kind of comforting and probably helped reduce frustrations. One of the other downsides here is rotor size and caliper power. Flat mount brakes were intended to be used with smaller rotors. Although there are some workarounds and there have been improvements in this regard, the two piston caliper and smaller surface area on the brake pads gives you less stopping power. All right, so I do expect to see some improvements in this field and we actually already have, but for the sake of all mankind, if I see a flat mount brake on mountain bikes, no, not happening. Whatever you can do, tell your favorite frame manufacturer you don't want it because we don't want it, no. When I swapped from two by 10 to one by 11 drivetrains in 2012, I was certain that that was the ultimate mountain bike drivetrain. And I thought at the time it couldn't get any better. Was I ever wrong? It seems like the one by 11 was simply just a bridge to the one by 12. Roughly four years later, SRAM launched Eagle, a one by 12 drivetrain, which provides a 500% gear range with a 10, 52 tooth cassette, and thus the death of the front derailleur, at least on mountain bikes, right? A few years later, Shimano caught up and launched their 1x12 in 2018 and upped the game by one tooth with a 1051 tooth cassette. Today, the largest cassette available is a 952 tooth from KCNC. But the question here is, did we really need something beyond 11 gears? or even beyond a front derailleur? Well, the results here were pretty telling. With 1,339 people, or 65.7% voting that 12 speed drivers were worthy innovations, where 28.3 said it was marketing hype and 122 people had no opinion. I guess we can almost clump one by 11 and one by 12 together here because I think the biggest haters of the one by drivers are those who had no issues with the front derailleur in the first place. Those folks really actually enjoyed the small increments between shifts and I sometimes miss that too. But many of us have adopted around the one by, including drivetrain manufacturers, of course. The one by system does mean that there is much more chain angle on the cassette, but much of this was resolved with boost and super boost spacing, tighter cogs, and a narrower chain. This has helped alleviate front derailleur rub altogether, or even issues with the front derailleur as a whole. It's a lighter setup, it's much easier to adjust, and if you want to change 
your gearing, all you have to do is swap out front chain rings. Is the one buy for everyone? No, absolutely not. But the competition between drivetrain manufacturers makes us believe, of course, that it is the present and future. Oh, and stay tuned to my thoughts on the pinion system. I finally got one to test long term and I cannot wait to share my thoughts. All right, so I just wanna take a quick moment to let you all know that this video is supported in part by Salsa Cycles. The Salsa Cycles Anything Cradle is one of the most overlooked solutions for carrying dry bags off your handlebars. The hinge system makes it easy to put on or remove from your bike and it prevents compressing, stressing, or damaging to your bike's shift and brake lines or head tubes. The super stable and waterproof design works great alone or add the front accessory pouch for quick access to frequently used items. I used the original version a while back and the hinge and weight saving update on the new version are great improvements. So for more on Salsa and the Anything Cradle, make sure to hit this card right here or find the link in the description below. All right, so I'm sure many of you have heard of Mike Levy from Pink Bike. Well, he was actually the person that coined the term down country, I don't know, maybe five years ago now. And it has stuck <laughs> with frame and tire manufacturers actually using the term. But what is down country? Well, really it's just a modern day XC bike with the ability to roll descents with a bit more confidence. So with the seeming death of XC racing as a whole, mainly because of the popularity of gravel and gravel events. Manufacturers are thinking of ways to reach more people and what better way to do this than design a bike that excels on the downs but also climbs well. Something in the 120 rear, 120 front millimeter travel range that has the ability to go far and be efficient, which is kind of a perfect bikepacking bike when you think of it. The other part of down country is down country parts like the Vittoria Sierra, a tire built around speed, grip, and durability. So is down country legitimate or just another way to convince us to spend a little bit more money? 51.4% of you all think down country is just marketing hype. Well, 27.8 have no opinion or are unsure and the remaining 20.8 think it was a worthy innovation. I just think it's kind of funny that one of the most popular journalists in the industry coined a term and it stuck. I love it. All right, so I will say I have pedaled and had a pretty good time on a handful of downcountry bikes before. They are limited in a few aspects, say on the descending side of things, but when bikepacking, they do make a fantastic rig for all day rides. I even pedaled one on the Colorado Trail in 2011, and it indeed was one of the more fun experiences I've had compared to the four previous times I've been en route. So I do think it's important to note here, sure, these bikes, yeah, they, they are efficient, but I also argue that my trail bike, which is maybe ever so slightly slower on the ups and much faster on the downs, is likely just as fast from point A to point B. So in the end, to me, down country is just modern day XC bike. It's not necessarily a race bike like those you see on, I don't know, the UCI circuit. It's a bike that can do a little bit more than your race bike. But if down country is here to stay, let's get rid of XC. That's kind of the same thing. Modern XC, down country. What do you think? Tubeless tires have been around for a while, actually dating back to the 1890s when Charles Kingston Welch developed the first tubeless tire. But it really wasn't until 1999 or 2000 when they actually gained some steam when Mavic, Michelin, and Hutchinson developed the universal tire standard. In between then and now, many brands have adapted and created different standards, but we have come to a rim, tire, and sealant combination to make most tires and rims tubeless compatible. While this technology was first designed for off-road tires and wheels, it has now been adopted to gravel and even road bikes. According to you all, tubeless tech is the most accepted innovation in our poll, with just shy of 90% of you all voting for worthy innovation, with the other 10% voting for either marketing hype or had no opinion. So you may be asking, what is the benefit of replacing a tube with sealant? Well, there are a few obvious ones, such as puncture protection. When you puncture a tube, you typically need to take that tube out and either patch it or just replace it. With a tubeless system, the sealant is designed to seal the puncture on its own. Another benefit is the ability to run lower tire pressures, which allows you to use all of the tire 
kind of how it was intended or designed. And because of this, it will be a more comfortable and reliable ride. Not to mention it usually saves a little bit of weight along the way as well. On the downside here, it does take a few more steps such as installing tubeless tape and valves, which is also a little bit more expensive. And the process is, or at least can be, a little bit more messy. But overall, I've been saved countless times using a tubeless system, and I would simply not even consider putting a tube in. Even if I have a large puncture, I try to throw a plug in before, uh, before I take that tube out. So tubeless, I'm a big fan. Suspension on bikes is no new thing, obviously. But more recently, the gravel world has adopted suspension forks on bikes to help ease those you know, rough roads. In 2015, Cannondale launched the 30 millimeter Lefty Oliver on the slate, which was a 650B big volume road bike, which I should mention was kind of before its time. In 2016, the Lauf Grit Gravel Fork came out, being the first gravel-specific aftermarket suspension fork. Fast forward to 2017, Fox, followed by MRP, used their creativity to put together a shorter travel fork to help dampen the bumps that you might find on some dirt roads. Today, Fox, MRP, Suntour, RockShox, and Lauf all offer aftermarket suspension forks in the 30 to 60 millimeter travel range. So 63.4% of you all think these forks are marketing hype, while 23.1% thought it was a worthy innovation, and the rest had no opinion. So I'll be honest, I don't have much time on these gravel suspension forks outside of a few rides. And the team here at bikepacking.com doesn't really either. The consensus we kind of came up with is that the gravel bike with a suspension fork is kind of niche. If we were to ride something a bit more rough, we kind of find ourselves on, say, a hardtail mountain bike with suspension fork. I also think the 50 millimeter tire clearance on most of these is a super limiting factor. But if there was a fork that could say fit 2.35 inch tires, I think we'd certainly consider it when testing a drop bar mountain bike. The other thing is, well, especially when they're mounted on smaller volume bikes or a gravel bike that has like a 35 millimeter tire, they look really weird and kind of ugly. Not to mention they're very expensive. <laughs> that said, if you are set on a gravel bike and looking for additional comfort, it could be a good alternative. It's certainly going to help dampen those small bumps and also perhaps make you feel a little bit more confident on some technical bits, but it is going to add more weight. It's also potentially going to lead to some more complications. And don't forget, there is a required annual service on them. Well, not the Lauf, but. Similar to the 1x12 conversation, it's pretty interesting to see the industry go from 1x11 to 1x12 Bluetooth actuated shifting so quickly. It was like one day I was playing Snake on my Nokia phone, and then the next I had a touch screen, unlimited games, and people were stealing data from me. Good times, right? Shimano seems to have success with products that come to market and change the market. They have some power of sorts. While a few systems were introduced before DI2, such as Suntour Beast, uh, which was like an electronic front derailleur crankset, the Mavic Mechtronic, and the Speedtronic from Zax, and Campy was also working on theirs. In 2009, DI2 became available to the public after plenty of anticipation. And since then, there has been a lot of evolution in the electronic shifting world, including wireless shifting from SRAM. But is electronic shifting worth the price tag? So according to you all, it's pretty split, with 44.3% voting it a worthy innovation, 44.2% of you think it's marketing hype, and the rest had no opinion. All right, so I've actually gone back and forth over the years from DI2 to access to mechanical to DI2 to access to mechanical again. And one thing that I keep telling myself is that nothing shifts better than an electronic system, at least one that is set up properly. Over the long haul, from install to, I don't know, thousands of miles, electronic systems need little to no adjustment. And there's no need to actually replace a cable and housing. It's pretty easy. Oh, and if you want to install your own electronic system, well, it's easy. It's like as easy as turning on a brand new phone. Well, a few more steps, but you get the point. On the flip side, you do need to maintain your battery, which somewhat takes away from that simplicity of the electronic system. And when you are bike packing, it's another cable or battery or, I don't know, battery pack that you need to carry. But in the end, pricing is the biggest barrier for many to enjoy this reliable and crisp shifting experience. And while there have been more budget options like the SRAM Access GX, 
which is still going to cost you like 450 to 600 USD, depending. Right now, it seems like SRAM has an abundance of stock and they're discounting like crazy. So this might be the best time to buy that stuff. But I remember saying that I was never going to go back to mechanical shifting. Yet this year, I've pedaled more miles without a battery. So the evolution continues, and that wraps up our third and final dissecting the bike industry video. Now you likely notice I missed a few things such as 26 inch wheels and perhaps rim brakes. Don't worry, we're going to touch on that in 2023. But if you have any comments or questions regarding the six topics we just spoke about, leave it in the comment section below. As always, thank you all so much for watching. Until next time, pedal further.